Please be advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, UCC Challenges Dealing with Post-Filing Changes. My name is Annie Tribaletti and I'll be your moderator for today. So joining us today is Paul Hodnafield. Paul is the Associate General Counsel for CSC where he's responsible for advising the company regarding real estate recording, notary, uniform commercial code, and other public record transaction services. So with that, I'd like to welcome Paul. Thank you, Annie. Um, yeah, as Annie mentioned, I'm Associate General Counsel with CSC, and uh, in that capacity, I'm responsible for monitoring uh, UCC-related legislation, case law, and other developments. I do a lot of troubleshooting with filing offices, and uh, uh, generally get a lot of information from a lot of different sources. So I, I do enjoy being able to share that, and uh, that's what I'm going to do today. And in fact, what I'm going to do today is address uh, actually some of the biggest challenges under uh, UCC Article 9, and that those have to do with uh, po uh, 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 post-filing changes to debtor and collateral information uh, after, and how it impacts the financing statement. I mean, prior to closing a secure transaction and perfecting the security interest, lenders and legal counsel make great efforts to do everything right. Uh, they conduct thorough due diligence, verify the accuracy of the financing statement, and are careful to ensure that the record is properly filed in the correct jurisdiction. Then when the deal is closed and the security interest is perfected, the secure party might think it is fully perfected if the debtor later files, or defaults, I should say, or, or files for bankruptcy. Um, unfortunately, this isn't always the case. The secure party's risk doesn't end just because uh, the deal's closed and the security interest has been perfected by filing. No matter how diligent the filer was before closing, certain post-filing changes involving the debtor or collateral could place the secured party's perfection and priority at risk. Now, not every post-closing or post-filing change requires the secured party to take action. Many types of changes have no effect whatsoever on the perfection or priority of the security interest. However, when certain critical changes occur, the secure party must take action uh, and specific actions listed in Article 9, and they have to do so within short statutory deadlines. Uh, the secure party's failure to take the required action may lead to harsh results. Uh, therefore, it is important that lenders and legal counsel know how to identify critical post-filing events and what actions they have to take in response to those events. Now that might seem easy enough, but post-filing changes can raise some of the most complex filing issues that arise under Article 9. The rules can be confusing and counterintuitive. Furthermore, it can be difficult to identify all the rules that apply to a particular change event. The rules are not always neatly organized together in the code. Uh, they're dispersed throughout Article 9. Despite the complexity, Article 9 requires secured parties to strictly comply with the statutory filing requirements when critical post-filing changes occur. Substantial compliance isn't enough in most cases. The secured party cannot even claim a lack of knowledge as an excuse for noncompliance uh, following a critical post-filing change. The stakes are very high, and the complexity of the issues can be uh, rather challenging, and this leads to a lot of questions about the process for dealing with post-closing changes or post-filing changes. Uh, this program is intended to help lenders and legal counsel better understand post-filing change issues and how to manage the risks associated with these critical changes. So what I plan to do today is begin with a brief introduction to the Article 9 filing system to offer a better uh, understanding of why post-filing changes are so important. Then I'll move on to the uh, uh, post-filing changes of greatest concern, namely a debtor name change, a new debtor uh, becoming bound by the security agreement, or what often is called a double debtor issue, a change in the governing law, and finally uh, transfers of collateral. 
For each of these events, I will focus on two separate issues. First, the impact of the event on existing collateral, uh, and then the impact of the event on collateral acquired after the event. I will also explain what actions the secured party needs to take and the applicable deadlines. At the end of the presentation, I'll offer some suggestions for how secured parties can minimize their risk by tracking at least some of the post-filing changes. And there will be, uh, hopefully, some time for questions. So with that, I'll go ahead and get uh, started um, with the, the introduction to the Article 9 filing system. So this will be basic for many of you, but it never hurts to have a quick refresher. Uh, what we're dealing with here are security interests. Security interest is a, a right of the holder of the security interest to uh, seize and sell collateral of a debtor to satisfy an obligation if the debtor defaults. It arises by contract between the debtor and the secured party. That's called the security agreement. And it's important to understand that be, by granting a security interest in, uh, in their assets, the debtor is uh, denying those assets to third parties who might also have claims against the debtor. And so to make the security interest enforceable against the rights of third parties, we have a, a concept called perfection, which is really a, a, a nothing more than a method of providing notice to third parties of the claim security interest so that they can protect themselves before they enter into a uh, transaction with the debtor. Uh, most of the time, uh, security interests are perfected by the filing of a UCC financing statement, and that's what we're going to be dealing with here today. Another important thing to understand about the, the filing system is that it is a notice filing system. What gets filed are not liens and security interests. They are mere notices that a security interest may exist. And as notices, uh, these are very basic uh, documents. The financing statement simply provides the basic information to alert a third party of a claim of a security interest and point them in the right direction to gather additional information. It is the... Uh, interested parties' job to contact the parties involved uh, to learn the full state of affairs. The notice filing system is intended to protect those interested parties, in other words, third parties, potential creditors, by giving them notice of the security interest. And as I mentioned, the, what gets filed are not the liens or security interests themselves, just the notice. Now, if there is a post-filing change to a financing statement, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it can be critical because it can prevent third parties from locating the, the, uh, the notice of the security interest. And if that happens, then third parties are not able to protect themselves. And so the rules around post-filing changes are generally there to protect the interests of third parties. Uh, so um, if there is a post-filing change to debtor or collateral information or the governing law, uh, the secured party's perfection may be fully or, or, or partially at risk, depending on the change that's involved, unless they take uh, action to protect themselves. I mentioned earlier, too, that these are complex issues, um, that, and, and in fact, some of the most complex issues that arise under the filing rules of Article 9. I pointed out that the applicable rules are scattered throughout Article 9 in different sections. Um, and uh, if, uh, if you find this rather confusing, don't worry. Even the courts struggle with these issues, and I'll be able to demonstrate that with some case law coming up here in a little bit. But it is important to know that the UCC and the courts have demonstrated that they are unforgiving for secured parties that do not uh, strictly follow the rules when it comes to post-filing changes. Uh, remember that these filing rules are there to protect third parties, and so the burden is placed on the secured party to, um, uh, to fully comply with the, their obligations. So the secured party is solely responsible for taking uh, any action that's required uh, following a post-filing change. And the secured party cannot even claim a lack of knowledge as an excuse for noncompliance. The strict compliance is required, and it's the secured party's responsibility to uh, stay up to date on uh, the status of debtors and collateral. Now, remember, I mentioned that uh, there are a number of different sections of Article 9 that are applicable to post-filing changes. I've 
listed the most important ones on the uh, screen here. Uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, for many is to figure out which ones apply in which situations. A, a good rule of thumb uh, or a good bit of advice is that uh, when a post-filing change occurs, be sure to look at the official comments to each of the uh, applicable sections because the official comments do a really good job of pointing out what other sections are implicated. Uh, so, for example, a, a debtor name change under 9507 will uh, uh, it necessarily involve uh, the impact of Section 9503 and 9506, which deal with sufficiency of debtor names, um, and uh, the amendments necessary uh, to, to fix that are in 9512, and uh, the official comments will provide oftentimes a good roadmap to see what other uh, sections may also apply to that uh, particular post-filing change. Well, let's go on and talk about the specific changes that uh, should be of most concern to secured parties. We'll begin with the debtor name change. This is a, a common post-filing change. Um, there are a number of events that can result in a debtor name change. If the debtor is a registered organization, uh, the name changes only when uh, an amendment uh, to the Articles of uh, Formation, uh, Articles of uh, Incorporation or Organization, uh, or the equivalent formation documents is filed. In other words, when the public organic record uh, has an amendment filed that um, uh, purports to change the name of the entity. Um, the, uh, the name doesn't change just because the registered organization gets a new uh, uh, trade name or DBA or something like that. It's only when the, the public organic record changes. For other organizations, however, it may be more difficult to determine when and how the name changes because there, there may be no public record filing involved, and this requires uh, closer monitoring of the entity uh, when there are, uh, for these types of debtors. And for an individual, the name can change in a number of different ways. If the driver's license changes or uh, expires, that can trigger a name change, that can be a name change event. Uh, there could be other events, depending on the state. Uh, there, there are different uh, uh, schemes for sufficiency of individual debtor names in use. Uh, the majority is the driver's license only if rule, but there are some states that uh, use that as a safe harbor and a couple others that have non-uniform provisions. And so with individuals, it may be uh, uh, also a challenge to figure out uh, when and, and how a name changed. But if a uh, secure party discovers that one of its debtors' uh, name has changed, then uh, the first step is to figure out, did the name change render the financing statement seriously misleading? Uh, the, the financing statement filed under the former debtor name. That's really the first step. And uh, to, to make that determination, it's important to understand the general rule for debtor name sufficiency, and that is that the debtor name on a financing statement has to strictly comply with the uh, uh, applicable requirements of Section 9503A based on the type of debtor or whether the collateral is held in a trust or being administered by decedent's personal representative. If it doesn't strictly comply with 9503A, it will render the financing statement seriously misleading under 9506B, and, uh, uh, and we've got uh, a name change that has rendered the financing statement seriously misleading. However, there is a, uh, uh, a savings clause, we'll call it. Uh, it's, it's not really a safe harbor, but it says that uh, if the debtor name isn't correct, if a search of the correct debtor name using the jurisdiction standard search logic would disclose the record, then the error in the debtor name doesn't render the financing statement seriously misleading. So it's possible to have a debtor name change, but not have a seriously misleading debtor name under 9506C. But um, you know, just because it, it uh, shows up on a 9506C search doesn't mean that the secured party shouldn't take any action. Uh, so the first step really is to run a 9506C search on the new debtor name. Uh, if, the, if it turns up the old debtor name, that's great. 
uh, then then it's not seriously misleading uh, at that point in time. But if the record isn't disclosed uh, under the old better name, then the secured party must take action. And uh, that's set forth in Section 9507C, and uh, that really requires filing an amendment. Now, a couple of things that I want people to understand. One is never rely on the search logic to prevent an otherwise insufficient name from rendering the financing statement seriously misleading. The reason is search logic can change. Uh, and sometimes it's published, sometimes it's not. Oftentimes it's not. And uh, just because a financing statement shows up on a 9506C search one day doesn't mean it's going to show up the next day. And if it doesn't show up and the secured party hasn't amended the financing statement, that could be a problem. So really, if it show if the former name shows up on a 9506C search under the new name, uh, that's great, but the secured party should still file an amendment to add the new name so that there's no question down the road. Um, if, regardless, when filing an amendment to uh, uh, bring the name into compliance, the best practice is to file an amendment to add the new debtor name, uh, even if the difference from the uh, old name appears small. It's better to do an ad, I th and this is my humble opinion, check with legal counsel to, to verify that in a particular situation. But generally, it's better to add the new debtor name and keep the old debtor name in place so both of them uh, continue to uh, be reflected on the financing statement. Now, when a debtor has changed its name in such a way as to render a filed financing statement seriously misleading, uh, the effect on existing collateral is minimal. Uh, the, the secured party will remain perfected for existing collateral and collateral acquired within four months after the name change, even if they take no action to amend the financing statement. So it can sit out there forever under the old name and can even be continued under the old name, and the secured party will remain perfected on the existing collateral. The real risk is uh, after acquired collateral, which oftentimes includes some very valuable collateral like accounts and inventory and, and things like that. So the, the effect on after acquired collateral uh, is that uh, the secured party will become unperfected for in collateral acquired more than four months after the name change unless the secured party files an amendment to add that new uh, debtor name to the financing statement. So what is this, uh, how, how can we visualize this? Well, let's uh, start out. Uh, if the debtor's name changed on June 1st, 2023, uh, that gives the secured party four months in which to file the amendment. If the amendment isn't filed in that four-month period, the secured party becomes unperfected on October 1, 2023 for after-acquired collateral, but remains perfected for uh, collateral acquired uh, before June 1st or during that four-month period. So it's after acquired collateral where the secured party will become unperfected. Uh, if, however, the secured party files an amendment to make the financing statement not seriously misleading during that four-month period, then the secured party remains, perf uh, the security interest remains perfected in the collateral all the way through the process and off into the future until the financing statement is terminated or uh, uh, lapses by time. So the, um, uh, you know, by filing in that four-month window, there's no break in continuity, no break in priority, no break in perfection for either existing or after acquired collateral. However, what happens, <laughs> uh, I think, more commonly is that uh, the four-month window will pass before the secured party discovers the name change, and they run and file a new amendment uh, afterwards. So if we have, uh, if the secured party isn't aware, or, or for whatever reason, they don't file the amendment until December 1st of 2023, um, they, are, they will become unperfected until December 1st, 2023 in after acquired collateral. They'll remain perfected in the existing collateral acquired uh, before the name change or for four months afterwards, which would be October, up to October 1st. But because they didn't file the amendment, they're unperfected in after-acquired collateral beginning on October 1 
and the amendment would reperfect that uh, security interest, but it would only have a priority date from December 1st. So the secured party would lose priority uh, against competing security interests and other claimants to the collateral. So what happens in the event of a debtor name change? Well, it's important for secured parties to be diligent with their debtors. Uh, the, the biggest challenge is finding uh, when a debtor changes its name. There may be loan covenants and things that uh, are, are in, the, uh, in the loan documentation that require the debtor to immediately notify the secured party of any contemplated or actual name change and, and other things. But, you know, frankly, the last thing many debtors will do, be it small business or an individual, it, the last thing they're going to think of is to notify the lender. So oftentimes the lender isn't going to be to be able to rely on the debtor. So it's going to be important for the secured party to closely monitor the debtor and monitor the status of the debtor name. Um, at the earliest possible time, amend the financing statement to reflect uh, the correct debtor name uh, so as to make it not seriously misleading. Uh, that can be a debtor change or a debtor or an ad of the new debtor name. I tend to prefer ad, but um, you know, again, it's something that should be determined in consultation with legal counsel uh, based on the particular situation. Remember, it must be filed either before or within four months after the debtor name change. And then I think it's always a good idea to conduct a post-filing search on the new name. So once the amendment has been filed, uh, conduct a 9506C search on the new name, just as if it was a new initial financing statement, to uh, make sure that it does show up on the search and that the, the record was correctly filed and, and indexed. Uh, there's a number of different cases out there involving uh, debtor name changes. Uh, in, in Ray Lifestyle Home Furnishings, this case from 2010, uh, the debtor changed its name from Factory Direct to Lifestyle Home Furnishings, two very different names. The secured party failed to amend its financing statement to add the new debtor name uh, within that four-month window. Actually, I think they, they didn't manage to uh, amend it at all. Uh, so they, they remained perfected in their existing collateral, but they became unperfected for collateral acquired by the debtor more than four months after the name change. And uh, that cost the secured party uh, significantly in this case. Broy Hill Furniture Industries versus Hudson Furniture Galleries. Here, um, the, uh, the first priority security secured party um, didn't amend its financing statement following the debtor's name change. Um, the uh, second priority secured party filed under the correct name of the debtor and uh, was aware of the debtor name change. And the first priority secured party argued that the second priority should not uh, be able to jump ahead of it because it, uh, it had knowledge of the name change, um, whereas the, uh, the first priority secured party, you know, uh, they didn't. But in any event, uh, the courts went ahead and said, well, uh, actual knowledge of the name change didn't relieve the senior secured party's duty to file its amendment or refile its financing statement. Actually, in this case, it would have been just to, to amend its financing statement. Uh, because it didn't do so, the first priority secured party lost its priority position to the junior lender. So uh, important to remember that knowledge is not a factor in determining the uh, secured party's obligations to comply with the requirements. Uh, in Ray Waste Tech, that's an interesting one. What happened is the, the uh, secured party and the uh, debtor closed on a loan, and uh, before the secured party perfected its security interest by filing, the debtor changed its name, and it continued to operate under the old name, but it had officially changed its name in the corporate records of the Secretary of State. Well. In that case, the, uh, the court said the lender was unsecured because at the time of filing, the, the, the debtor name, it wasn't really a debtor name change. They were using the old debtor name, and it was wrong. 
So uh, it is a good idea to monitor between uh, between closing and filing as well to make sure that the debtor hasn't changed its name uh, in that type of situation. All right, the second most common post-filing event, well, I don't know what's most common, but one, one of the more difficult is what happens when a new debtor becomes bound by the security agreement. It's sometimes called the double debtor issue. Uh, a new debtor uh, mean, is really any person that becomes bound by a security agreement entered into by another person. Uh, this can happen when uh, there's an op- uh, it, it can happen by contract or it can op- operate by operation of law other than Article 9, such as um, uh, you know the security agreement. Uh, uh, you know, person becomes generally obligated for another person. Um, including uh, the loans that uh, another person has taken out. Um, and uh, there's others that are listed. This, it's a good idea to take a look at the official comment to Article 9 to Section 9203D um, and, uh, and 9508 as well, which is what governs uh, what happens when a new debtor becomes bound. But if a new debtor becomes bound, the original debtor's security agreement becomes enforceable against the new debtor. And it isn't necessary to uh, uh, enter into a new security agreement. But uh, if there is a change in such a way that the name is different, it can be an issue. Uh, Some things that that can trigger a new debtor becoming bound, uh, one is an acquisition where the acquiring party is going to uh, succeed to all the uh, obligations of uh, of the acquired party, the original debtor. Uh, a merger where the surviving entity or, uh, or new entity is bound by the security agreements entered into by an original debtor, and, it, and sometimes a change in structure, converting from one uh, business entity to another or sole proprietor that incorporates um, the, the new entity can become bound by the, uh, by the security agreement entered into by the original debtor. Now, what's the effect of this? There's a couple assumptions I want to put out. Number one is that uh, following the new debtor becoming bound, that the new debtor name is sufficiently different from the original debtor name so that the filed financing statement under the original debtor name is seriously misleading with respect to the new debtor, and that the new debtor and the original debtor are located in the same jurisdiction. Otherwise, it triggers a change in governing law, which we'll talk about in a minute. As far as a new debtor becoming bound when it comes to existing collateral, a financing statement, uh, just like with a debtor name change, is going to remain effective to perfect the security interest in collateral acquired before or within four months after the new debtor became bound. Uh, So if the the new debtor acquires this collateral um, from the uh, original debtor uh, before or within four months after uh, the event, uh, they will conti- the secure party will continue to remain perfected in that existing collateral. But it, for after acquired collateral, that acquired more than four months after the new debtor becomes bound, uh, a financing statement naming the original debtor is not going to be effective to perfect the security interest in after acquired collateral uh, that uh, is the debtor the new debtor obtains more than four months after the uh, uh, after it becomes bound by the security agreement. There is an exception. Uh, the secure party can remain perfected in after acquired collateral if it files an initial financing statement naming the new debtor before that before that four month deadline. So just like with a, a, a new debtor name, a new debtor becoming bound has that four month window. Um, there are some different effects on priority, however. Uh, a security interest in after acquired property created by the original debtor might be subordinated in some cases to a security interest in after acquired property that's created by the new debtor. Um, You can take a look at uh, uh, Section 9326, Comment 2, Example 2, to to illustrate that. There are certain conditions there, which I really don't have time to go into, but there are circumstances where it could be, um, uh, there could be a risk of subordination. Um, the, the secured party within that four-month window after the new debtor becomes bound, uh, the, uh, Section 9508B2 says that uh, the secured party must file an initial financing statement naming the new debtor. 
Well, an initial financing statement to most people is a new UCC-1. However, uh, Section 9512, which deals with amendments, and uh, Fisher Comment 5 uh, states that an amendment to add a new debtor name would constitute an initial financing statement naming the new debtor. A uh, couple things on that. Number one, don't file a name change amendment to the financing statement naming the uh, original debtor, because if it changes the name from the original debtor, there's a risk that it could undo the original priority on that financing statement. So it's better to just kind of leave it alone or add the uh, add the new debtor name rather than doing a change because a change isn't going to be also a new initial financing statement with respect to the to the new debtor also bear in mind that even though the amendment if a, if an amendment is filed to add the debtor name uh, the new debtor name the amendment while it may constitute a new initial financing statement with respect to the new debtor, it does not extend the lapse date. The financing statement is still subject to its original uh, uh, file date and lapse date, and the continuation window doesn't change. So uh, uh, you would have an initial financing statement, uh, or the equivalent of an initial financing statement, but it would have a, a uh, it wouldn't have a five-year effective date from the time the new debtor is added. Uh, rather, it would still have its original lapse date, and that means uh, it's necessary for the secured party to maintain that record. So in the event of a, debtor name ch or a, a new debtor becoming bound by a security agreement, there are a few things that secured parties should do. Number one, file an, a new initial financing statement to provide the name of the new debtor. Um, the idea here, again, is to uh, uh, either file a new initial financing statement or file an amendment that adds the name of the new debtor. It must be done before or within four months after the new debtor becomes bound to ensure continuation of perfection and after acquired collateral. Um, so uh, it's important to get it in within that four-month uh, window and provide the name of the new debtor. I think it's also a good idea, if it's a separate financing statement naming the new debtor, to keep the original financing statement naming the uh, original debtor active. This ensures that, it, uh, that a public record remains of the original uh, filing and perfection uh, or perfection and priority date and uh, that it's there in the public record and can be retrieved as necessary. Finally, it's always a good idea, uh, whenever filing amendments that affect debtor names, to file uh, or to conduct a uh, search to reflect on the new debtor name. Uh, this will identify, uh, for one thing, it'll, it'll identify uh, potentially conflicting security interests under the new debtor name that could result in subordination and allows the secured party to, to take action there. It also, of course, will identify any uh, uh, indexing errors or, or debtor name errors that um, uh, could affect the secured party's status. So it's, a, it's always a good idea to conduct a search to reflect in these circumstances. Uh, the next event is a change in the governing law. And uh, this can occur in uh, a variety of circumstances. Well, what is a change in governing law? <clears throat> Well, it's, uh, it's important to understand that, uh, you know, the law of the jurisdiction where the debtor is located governs perfection and priority in, uh, of a security interest or agricultural lien, with certain exceptions for different types of collateral, like uh, fixtures, timber, minerals, and that, uh, so forth. But we're, we're, we're dealing with Secretary of State level filings here right now. Um, and uh, so the law of the jurisdiction where the debtor is located uh, governs that. But what happens if the debtor uh, changes their location? So a change uh, to the debtor's situation or a transfer of collateral to a person located in a different jurisdiction may cause the law of another state to govern perfection and priority. Uh, and by law of another state, law of another state than the state where the financing statement was originally filed. So what kind of things trigger a change in governing law? Well, if it's a registered organization, if the registered organization redomesticates in a new state, and that state's law provides continuity of the original entity, so if it's a, a Washington 
corporation and it redomesticates as a Delaware uh, corporation or Delaware LLC and Delaware law, uh, and I'm just making this up, uh, here's an example, but if Delaware law says it's the same entity as originally existed in Washington, um, then you've got that continuity and uh, you know the registered organization is redomesticated. Otherwise, it's a transfer to a different debtor. Uh, for other types of organizations uh, that are not registered organizations, if it relocates its chief, chief executive office uh, or place of business to a new state, you know, moving across state lines, that can trigger a change in the governing law. And for an individual, if the person moves their principal residence to a different state, uh, so you have somebody who lives in, uh, I don't know, St. Paul, Minnesota, and they move to Hudson, Wisconsin, um, They've crossed state lines. Now a different state would govern perfection and priority. Uh, so a financing statement filed in uh, Minnesota is no longer, um, you know, it, it, uh, Minnesota law would no longer govern perfection and priority. Um, if a new debtor becomes bound by the security agreement entered into by the original debtor, uh, and the new debtor is located in a different state, that can trigger a change in the governing law as well. And in some cases, a uh, transfer of collateral to a party that's located in a different state uh, may trigger a change in the governing law. So what happens if there's a change in the governing law? Well, if the debtor is simply relocated from one state to another, uh, the secured party will remain perfected in uh, the existing collateral for four months after a change in the governing law, if the, and they, they will continue to be perfected uh, if they file uh, a new financing statement in the new jurisdiction. If, the, um, uh, if a new debtor becomes bound by the security agreement and is located in a different jurisdiction, uh, the secured party uh, remains perfected and has up to a year to trans uh, after the transfer of collateral to the new debtor to uh, file a financing statement in the new jurisdiction. And if the secured party fails to file within the four-month period or one-year period is applicable, they will become totally unperfected for both existing and after-acquired collateral. Uh, there's no, no grace period in there or, or no, uh, uh, I shouldn't say grace period, but the, it's, it's not like it is for a debtor name change uh, where you know, you, you remain perfected in existing collateral and, and uh, only lose after acquired. This all collateral, uh, secured, the security interest will simply become unperfected. Now, it may be a shorter period of time than one year or four months if the financing statement filed in the original jurisdiction uh, has a lapse date that's before the deadline ends in the new jurisdiction. The uh, a uh, secured party will have to file before the lapse date in the old jurisdiction. Otherwise, the old jurisdiction becomes perfected and there's no, or becomes unperfected when it lapses. And uh, there is no continuity of perfection and priority. And, uh, you know, they will, uh, filing in the new jurisdiction after that point will only get priority from the date of filing as opposed to being able to reach back to the original jurisdiction, or the original priority in the former jurisdiction. As far as after acquired collateral goes, there is a four month grace period uh, for a uh, secured party remaining perfected and after acquired collateral. This was a change with the 2010 amendments to Article 9. Originally, uh, revised Article 9 didn't uh, allow uh, any grace period and after acquired collateral, uh, but it, it is there now in Section 9316H. So there is a four month period. And again, that four month period may be shorter than the one-year period for uh, perfection in the new jurisdiction. So there is a potential issue where a secured party could become unperfected and after acquired collateral uh, if it doesn't file within that four-month period, but uh, it would remain perfected in uh, the uh, existing collateral for up to a year. So the secured party must refile by, the, by that four-month deadline to continue perfection uh, and priority in the after-acquired collateral. So following a change in the governing law, best practices, uh, secured parties should perfect in the new jurisdiction 
at the earliest opportunity, ideally even before the debtor relocates, if, if it's possible anyway. Uh, I think it's a best practice to keep the original financing statement in the former jurisdiction active. Again, this will preserve evidence of the original perfection and priority, which would disappear uh, once it lapses out. Uh, always a good idea to conduct a UCC search in the new jurisdiction to identify any per, uh, uh, potential conflicting security interests uh, and uh, also a, a search to reflect as well to uh, uh, ensure that the, the debtor name is correct and it was correctly indexed. There's a variety of cases out there involving changes in governing law. Um, uh, Farm Credit Services versus Wilson, what happened here was the debtor, um, uh, the debtor sold collateral to a buyer from out of state who took it out of state. And when the lender tried to uh, enforce, a, I think it was a conversion claim against the out-of-state buyer, the out-of-state buyer said you didn't re-perfect your security interest in, in the new state within, uh, within the, the correct amount of time. However, um, the, uh, the court uh, found otherwise uh, and said it's only uh, uh, the, the compliance requirement for filing in the new jurisdiction only affects priority between competing security interests. Here we had a competing interest of a security interest versus uh, the claim of a buyer of the collateral. And, uh, or, uh, and as a result, um, uh, the, uh, the secured party won, uh, had, uh, <laughs> had the um, buyer of the collateral you know, in different facts that may have come out differently. But bottom line on it is... Uh, 9316 applies to priority between the competing security interests, not necessarily different types of interests. Um, and in this case, the buyer actually had knowledge of the uh, security interest at the time of purchase, and therefore they acquired the uh, machinery subject to the security interest. Um, H&S contracting and kinetic leasing. Um, this was uh, you know, a fairly recent case. Secured party... Um, transferred uh, collateral from uh, a debtor in South Dakota to a new debtor in Minnesota uh, and never reperfected in Minnesota. Uh, but because the collateral was liquidated at auction before the one-year period expired following transfer to a, a new debtor in, in Minnesota, uh, the uh, secured party uh, security interest in identifiable proceeds uh, attached and um, uh, and, it, it, and it becomes permanently attached to that. So it didn't matter that the uh, secured party failed to file in Minnesota because the identifiable proceeds existed before uh, that time period ran out. Um, First National Bank, uh, Pick A. Yoon versus Pearl River Fabricators. This was an early case and demonstrates uh, some of the challenges the court ran into. Here... Uh, a secured party uh, took a security interest in equipment um, that was uh, uh, owned by a, a Mississippi corporation. And a Mississippi corporate, the Mississippi corporation sold the collateral to an Indiana corporation, which in turn then resold it to a Nevada corporation. And that corporation moved the equipment and located it physically in Louisiana. The court... Uh, because you know all the parties were registered organizations, none of them were organized under Louisiana law. However, the court determined that because the secured party failed to timely file in Louisiana within one year after the debtor transferred the uh, collateral, that it uh, was unperfected. Um, or uh, I think the court got this one very wrong, uh, at least as far as uh, uh, where the uh, where the, the record had to be filed and, and so forth. So I wouldn't rely on this case, but it does illustrate the challenges that the courts run into when uh, dealing with these types of issues. Now I want to talk about transfer of collateral, um, and, and I'm talking in the sense of a buyer in ordinary course of business. Ordinary, uh, in Ordinarily, uh, a buyer in ordinary course of business is going to take free 
of a security interest created by the seller of the goods. Now, by uh, ordinary course of a buyer in ordinary course of business is buying goods from a merchant engaged in selling goods of that kind. Uh, just like uh, you know, if you walk into a big box retail store and buy an, an expensive television, uh, you walk out of there with that television free and clear of the security interest uh, that is that applies to the uh, to the store's inventory, uh, assuming there is one, because uh, you know, walking out with that is a buyer in ordinary course of business. They're buying goods from a seller engaged in or uh, selling goods of that kind. And the idea here is, again, that we want people to be able to take free of the security interest so that some lender doesn't show up knocking on the door wanting to take the TV back if the big box retailer defaults. And so if the buyer, if the buyer is a buyer in ordinary course of business from the seller, uh, the secured party is limited to enforcing its security interest and its proceeds of the collateral in the hands of the, of the seller. Um, but if the buyer is not in ordinary course of business, the secured party uh, remains perfected and has priority without any further action, unless it is consented to the transfer. Um, so, uh, and, and that's assuming the buyer is located in the same jurisdiction as the debtor or seller of the goods. Um, so, if the if the transfer, however, is not, is not to a buyer in ordinary course or um, uh, a buyer out of the ordinary course, in other words, if it's transferred to a successor in interest, uh, then the new debtor rules apply under Section 9508. But uh, we're talking, our focus here is on buyers not in the ordinary course of business. So, uh, for instance, in Teague v. Taylor, a buyer of an all-terrain loader uh, that uh, uh, bought it from a, a landscaping business, uh, you know, the owners of the landscaping business were users of heavy equipment in that business, but they weren't in the business of selling heavy equipment. And therefore, the buyer uh, was not a buyer in ordinary course because they weren't get, buying it from a, somebody engaged in selling equipment of that kind. Um, so when the secured party filed its financing statement against the original debtor, that's all it was. That's all that mattered because the subsequent buyer was going to take subject to that security interest. There's no need to even amend the financing statement. The buyer wasn't the buyer in ordinary course of business. Uh, Element Financial Corp. Um, here, <laughs> the uh, there was uh, there was a company in I believe California that owned three Bobcat uh, pieces of equipment, three Bobcats, and. Uh, the owner of the business took the Bobcats and moved to Florida, didn't move the business, but moved the Bobcats to Florida, and then sold them um, to a, a buyer. And uh, the bank wanted to enforce its security interest the, uh, 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 against those Bobcats. Um, but the buyer was, uh, wasn't a buyer in ordinary course of business. Um, because they weren't buying from the uh, uh, they, they weren't they were subject to a security interest, but the security interest was not created by the seller. It was created by the first seller, and the, it was uh, taken without permission. And the first seller was not uh, uh, engaged in the uh, sale of that type of equipment normally. So. They get kind of kind of complex, and I encourage you, if you have questions, to read the case law to fully understand how the courts approach these things. So, if there is a transfer of collateral to a buyer that is not an ordinary course of business, it's not necessary to amend the financing statement. Um, in fact, amending the financing statement may be counterproductive because it could cause a loss of priority due to the change from the um, uh, uh, from the original. Uh, debtor. If the transferee is a successor in interest to the uh, uh, transferor, in other words, they're affiliated somehow, you know, one's uh, acquiring from the other, uh, it's a new debtor becoming bound in Section 9508 would apply. Um, also beware in these transfer situations of a change in the governing law if the transferee is located in a different state. Uh, the rules for a change in the governing law might apply uh, 
as as we've seen, these things oftentimes overlap, where you'll have a transfer to a, an out-of-state buyer or um, a new debtor becomes bound by the security agreement but is located in a different jurisdiction than the former debtor. So you can have these multiple uh, issues that arise in the same transaction. And that's what makes these things so complex um, and, uh, and make it so critical for secured parties to uh, pay attention to changes to their debtor or collateral status. So how does a, a lender identify post-filing changes? It's not always that easy. Um, there, it can be done uh, through internal procedures to help identify. In other words, anybody uh, that has contact with debtors uh, should be aware of what types of things to watch out for. I've heard of situations where um, you know, customer service personnel received a call from a debtor, and the debtor asked to change their address from one state to another. And the customer service people promptly did that. But it didn't reach the, that information didn't reach the people who were responsible for maintaining uh, the, uh, the loan documentation, and as a result, no amendment was filed. Um, so it's important that anybody who uh, is in a position where they can learn of these things be aware of what to look out for and who needs to be alerted. Uh, another uh, a way to identify uh, changes, at least for registered organizations, is through public records tracking. Uh, a lender can conduct a search of the Secretary of State records uh, on a regular basis, generally every 90 days, uh, to identify organizational changes, and uh, that'll leave uh, uh, 30 days, r roughly a month, to uh, to take action. Uh, but this is very labor-intensive, time-consuming, and, and costly. There are third-party automated tracking systems that uh, uh, search the public records for uh, changes to uh, uh, to to uh, registered organization public organic records, uh, CSC offers uh, this type of service. So it's it and, and as do our competitors, um, and it might be something to consider uh, consider tra uh, you know, using to help uh, avoid missing things like debtor name changes or uh, new debtors becoming bound, changes in governing law, and things like that. But there are limitations to tracking. Individual debtors generally can't be tracked because the driver's license isn't a public record unless the debtor volunteers the information that they have changed their name or that their driver's license has changed. Um, yeah, the, the lender may have no way to know about it unless they are in contact with the debtor regularly. And not all post-filing changes can be effectively tracked. You know, a transfer of collateral. Um, you know, you, um, unless the lender is going to drive by a, uh, a, you know, a warehouse or check the inventory from time to time, it may be difficult to find out uh, you know, when things have uh, disappeared. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, debtor name changes can be hard to track. I, I've heard of one who discovered it when uh, one lender found out because they were driving to work and noticed the name on the uh, debtor's building had changed. Uh, you know, things like that. It's uh, that's why it's so important to have that periodic contact with the debtor if there's any concern about a, a name change like that.